Hi everyone, my name is Brock McIntosh. Uh, a bit about me. I should also preface it by saying that these views are also mine and don't represent those of the U.S. military. I'm still in the Army National Guard. I'm a conscientious objector, uh, applicant. And a bit about me, I deployed to Afghanistan in November 08 uh, to a rural area called Wazakwa, and then a little bit in Coast City and got back in August 09, doing security patrols and Afghan police mentorship and so on. And while I was there, uh, I sort of realized really quickly that what we were doing wasn't working. And my initial reaction was actually to try to make war work. And so I started to, I, I got really interested in special forces. I started to read about special forces, read about warfare, the history and culture of Afghanistan, because special forces have to know those things. And it was through learning about these things and reading stuff from the Pentagon and reading stuff from counterinsurgency theorists that I began to realize this isn't going to work. And I began to realize that war just doesn't work in general and that it's unethical and it's, it's, it's inefficient. And so when I got back from Afghanistan, I tried to look for alternatives to things that could work in Afghanistan, things that could achieve uh, stabilization and liberation and how you can fight for injustice without using violence. And I discovered the power of nonviolence, the type that Martin Luther King used and Gandhi used during, doing a research paper about the Chicago Freedom Movement. And I became so enchanted with it that I took the next year off from college to, just, to study it on my own at different trainings around the country, the Highlander Folk School, um, Smart Meme, Ruckus Society, Center for Nonviolence and Peace Studies, and all, uh, and other places. And during my, during my year off, I was also interested to see what the potential was for a nonviolent social movement in Afghanistan, because this is how you democratize countries, is with social movements, um, with nonviolent social movements specifically. And so I began, I, I discovered a man named Bacha Khan. He was a Pashtun like the Taliban. And he lived under the British occupation in Western Pakistan. He organized 100,000 Pashtuns without Facebook to give up their weapons and follow him in a nonviolent struggle against the British. They would go from village to village teaching them how to be self-reliant and independent of the British rule. And when the British would confront them, they would, uh, take on, they would take on the pain without retaliating. Uh, cavalry, British cavalry would run over them with their horses and their cars, and all they would do was put their shawls in their mouths to keep from screaming. And the British couldn't figure out how to control them anymore, because they couldn't use death. With the fear of death, they couldn't use the fear of torture, the fear of jail. Nothing could get these people to do what they wanted them to do. And Bacha Khan was instrumental in getting the British to leave. So I began to think there is potential for a nonviolent movement in Afghanistan, and then the Arab Spring happened, and then I be became more excited. And I discovered a group called the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, and I reached, they reached out to me first, and I continued to gain a correspondence with them. And then they invited me to come back to Afghanistan. And I'd like to show a quick video of the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, a sort of introduction to who they are. That's your full name? Uh, my full name is we take young and the group you're working with is called afghan youth uh peace volunteers peace volunteers and where are they from uh, they are mainly from the province of bamiyan and recently we've managed to get a few youth in kabul interested in joining the group and what is the mission of the group um the original intention of the group was to raise the voice of peace from among the ordinary people of Afghanistan. Is that a popular message among people in Afghanistan? Uh, no. Uh, peace is... Uh, when uh, President Obama won the Nobel Peace Prize in 2009... Was given it anyway. He was given it. Uh, um, he represented the sort of peace that people understand here, a peace being war. And so with the message of that the, that the youth had with respect to true peace and reconciliation, uh, we can imagine that people were 
doubtful that they were sincere in talking about real peace. Um, they ridiculed them for perhaps being naive in an age when a person who has prosecuted war in this country has won a peace prize that peace was possible. Um, in fact, when we first started at the university in Bamiyan, over a three-month period of discussions on peace, the college students at Bamiyan University concluded at the end of the three-month workshop that peace is impossible in Afghanistan. Uh, so against that background, uh, the boys are, uh, and the youth, there are girls as well, are trying their best to give a clear voice, um, a clear message about the wish of ordinary Afghans to live without wars. They are so tired of the decades of war. We, we met this morning with a newspaper editor in Kabul, Kasim Akgar, and you asked him, do you think there can be a youth movement, a non-violent movement for peace, uh, as in Egypt, Tunisia, etc. And, and he seemed to say no, because even the youth are divided along ethnic lines. Uh, is that something that you see as insurmountable as well, or can you, uh, can you overcome that? Mm. I the people of Afghanistan don't see the ethnic division as insurmountable, but they realize that the years of war and division has not given them enough of an opportunity or space to make that happen. So it's not insurmountable, but it's going to take a lot of effort, and I would also say that it would mean uh, that the people of Afghanistan need to be able to recognize the systems that are bringing division within their society. And that system principally is a system of power in the hands of uh, violent, um, power-hungry people backed by the international community. And, and are the Afghan youth peace volunteers crossing ethnic lines? Or do, do you have members from different groups? Uh, we now consist mainly of two uh, groups, uh, ethnic groups, the Hazaras and the Tajiks. Uh, the boys had made a very intentional effort to involve the Pashtuns as well as the Uzbeks. Um, when we had come to the conclusion that peace was impossible uh, after the three-month workshop at Bamiyan College, we took the practical action of having a group of 16 college students from different ethnic groups stay together in four rooms over one semester. It created a bit of controversy in Bamiya. It raised awareness in the local community. Um, there were people who were suspicious and unhappy, but the college students who uh, participated in that one semester of staying together uh, felt that um, despite the difficulties and the uh, talk or insults from the community, um, this was something important for them to do. Subsequently, the youth had um, made handmade cell phone pouches from second-hand leather which they bought from the city. Uh, and over these cell phone pouches, they had hand-sewn the word sur, which in Dari means peace and they sent it to the youth, the Pashtun youth in Kandahar uh, and in, in, we, have, we had put that together in a little video as well and in that video 
of the boys sewing the pouches and sending it to the youth in Kandahar, we had a special message for um, the military commander. Uh, at the time, I think it was, I wonder if Petrius had taken over or was it Crystal? I think Petrius may have just <coughs> taken over. And I remember the uh, cell phone pouches uh, being received by the Pashtun youth in Kandahar, where all the fighting is supposed to be now. Uh, and the boys calling them from Bamiyan and saying, we have sewn these pouches of peace and we have sent them to you as an indication of our love and our desire for reconciliation. And the Pashtun youth leader there said, we can't believe it. We, this is impossible. That um, this is a love which you have shown us and we will never forget it. So there is an effort, a deliberate effort, to try to break across those ethnic lines. So the Afghan youth obviously are not naive. They understand what the situation there is and the obstacles that they're up against and what it's going to take. They have a six-point strategy that is, I think, is absolutely brilliant. And if I had to, if I was a gambler and I had to put my money on anyone, it would be the Afghan youth and another gentleman that I met during my year off named Ak named Akhmadullah Archiwal. You heard Hakim. Just people in the back. Oh yeah, you heard Hakim talking about uh, them trying to reach out to Pashtuns, like the Taliban are Pashtun, and Archiwal is Pashtun. He lives in Kunar. His father was killed by the Taliban. He actually used to work for the U.S. Embassy, and then he quit after he read a book called Civilian Jihad, which talks about all these different nonviolent social movements in Muslim countries. And he decided to dedicate his work towards a nonviolent social movement in Afghanistan. He's done a couple of civic mobilization trainings in Taliban-dominated provinces, using, using uh, a force more powerful, which he dubbed into Pashto, using, um, he translated civilian jihad, he also uses canvas materials translated into Pashto. Canvas is the Center for Applied Nonviolent Action Strategies. They're the group of Atpur youth that overthrew Milosevic and they uh, trained some of the youth in Egypt and Ukraine and Georgia and Lebanon. And uh, one of the things that I, hope, that I hoped to do during this trip, which I did do, is I introduced Archie Wall and the Afghan youth. And they, it looks like there's potential that they could be working together and there could actually be intertribal movement towards building a nonviolent movement in Afghanistan. And they're very realistic and they know exactly what it's going to take and they're very intelligent people. They think it'll take about 10 to 15 years for something significant to happen like Tahrir Square. But um, the other thing I hope to do on that trip was just to do fact finding and find out what Afghans think that, think that the problem is what they think the solutions are, and if there's any way that we could play a role in helping them, instead of being paternalistic and saying, we, we've determined what your problem is, and we've determined what the solution is, and we're gonna solve it for you, which is the sort of strategy that the U.S. is employing right now. Uh, just to piggyback some of what she was saying, I think that she's right that the military culture is just, it's the military culture and it's inherently violent, and it will be, war or not, it will be violent. Um, there's an interesting book called On Killing, which is written by Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. And he talks about how during World War II, only 25% of American soldiers who had a chance to fire at the Nazis fired their weapons. And only 15% of the 25 aimed. The other 10% purposely missed. And this is something that's not just in American culture. They did a study of the Prussian army during the Napoleonic Wars and found that they had a 50 to 70 percent accuracy rate during practice and only a 3 percent accuracy rate during actual battle. So the army went out of their way to try to increase that 25 percent. By the Korean Wars, about 50 percent. Now it's about 95 percent. They tried all sorts of different things. They tried PCP. Uh, they tried the clockwork orange method where they had soldiers peel their eyes open and watch disgustingly violent videos and it had the opposite effect. Opposite effect, it made them nauseous. It made them not want to participate in violence. 
and they started to to use some of the research that people like B.F. Skinner were using and other psychologists who know how to train animals. And they started to use these animal training techniques to get soldiers to do what they want. And they also started to use simulations. So before they used bullseye targets, now they use human-like targets that pop up and pop down and have human faces. And now you can get a headshot instead of a bullseye. And they have these really extravagant simulations where they have I, I trained at Fort Leonard Wood. They had what they called Sodder City. It was an entire concrete town with schools and cars and fake IEDs. And it makes war extremely realistic and it gets you comfortable with killing. And children grow up playing Call of Duty and Medal of Honor and knowing that, and f or feeling that serving, using violence to end violence is an honorable thing to do. It's a dutiful thing to do. And this is, this, is the, this is the culture of the military that's been built over the course of decades. And it's not going to get any better. It's only going to get worse. And one of the reasons I love nonviolence is because in warfare theory, Clausewitz would talk about how war is, an, is a political process, just like elections or jury duty. The difference is that war is the climax of the political process when there's no other means to achieve what you want. But it's a process that is extremely undemocratic. It's full of men. It's extremely violent. People who aren't sociopathic don't want to participate in that. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a culture that certain religions like Quakers can't participate in. Certain age groups can't participate in it. People with physical ailments can't participate in, it. participate in it. People with certain criminal backgrounds can't. It's an extremely undemocratic political process, and yet this is the climax of our, of our, of our policies. And that's why I love nonviolence, because anyone can participate in it, whether mm -hmm. you're a child in Birmingham, or an old person, or a handicapped person fighting for your disability rights. So. Uh, my name is Jacob George. Uh, I joined the Army in 2000. Uh, I did three tours in Operation Enduring Freedom between 01 and 04. My first tour when I was 19, about a month after September 11th. The second was the summer of 2002. And the third was 2003 and 2004. Now, I got out of the military in 2004. And I struggled. I was uh, homeless and, and drunk and a very violent person. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't until I went to college, you know, and kind of learned how to articulate my experiences and understand what had happened that I, that I began my path of healing. And then I became activated in 2010 uh, when my younger brother, who is nine years younger than me, received his orders to go to Afghanistan at the age of 19. And I stood with my brother looking at him, watching myself go back to war uh, nine years later. And uh, we sat down and had a long conversation about what was about to happen for him in his life. And our ultimate conclusion was prison was better than Afghanistan and that he should go AWOL. And upon making that decision, I told him that I would get on my bicycle and we'd ride across the South and tell everyone our story as brothers. And that's what we did. Uh, we started May 1st, 2010. We've covered over 6,000 miles on this bicycle tour in the American South. Um, the ultimate result for Jordan was he received a general discharge with honorable intent without a single day in jail for finding his voice. Since then, we've continued our work uh, on the bike ride. It's called a ride till the end for art, and we use art to facilitate the healing process and to open up palatable dialogue about war, which is kind of hard in the South. You gotta be crafty, so that's 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 why we use art. You know, it's a it's a way of presenting a narrative that is interpretive instead of absolute. Uh, but through this process, we discovered the healing properties of the catharsis that people go through when they present their narrative through art. 
so we decided to keep riding once we got results with Jordan and uh, we've seen some pretty amazing things happen. So Voices for Creative Nonviolence offered myself the opportunity to go to Afghanistan and meet with the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers, who we have here. I'm going to get my, my hat out of the way. And uh, I uh, had to take that offer for many reasons. Um, for a personal reason, I honestly, I wanted to go, I wanted to go be an Afghan. I wanted to wear their clothes, I wanted to eat their food, I wanted to look at their mountains, you know, I wanted to share their air, I just wanted to see what it felt like to be an Afghan. And I got what I asked for. Um, within the short month that I was there, uh, Brock and I were there together, uh, I had two U.S., two different soldiers point a weapon at me. And I know the fear that drives aimlessly slinging a weapon around at people uh, as a soldier in Afghanistan. But what I didn't know is what it felt like to be an Afghan looking up the barrel of that weapon. Uh, so that was a fear that I now understand. Now, I don't have to live with it. I got to come back home. But it helped me generate some empathy with the situation in Afghanistan and what it really feels like to be an Afghan on the other side of the gun. So we're going to show you some pictures from the delegation. Uh, there's some very inspiring stories in here. Uh, we'll try to keep it short though. So this is the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. Um, hmm? Some of them. Some of them, yes, it's some of them. Uh, this is in Kabul. They came to visit us. Uh, in the bottom right hand corner we have Abdullah. Uh, we have uh, Mary to his right uh, and Nancy, uh, both with Voices for Creative Nonviolence. In the left hand corner we have Imam Dodd, which was our very skilled driver. I don't know if any of you have ever driven around Kabul before, but I can't explain it yet. I'm still trying to digest it. <laughs> so next to him is Ollie, uh, a very special kid. Um, there's Brock, Ken, and Ed, and I'm the goofy one with the scarf on my head. So here we have um, Fahima, and she works for an organization called Afghan Women, or Women for Afghan Women, and she has a lot of different projects in Afghanistan, um, but this one in particular was rebuilding a school that had been uh, firebombed and destroyed by the Taliban, uh, and she's telling, she's telling these youth about the importance of knowing how to build your own schools, not expecting someone else to come into your country and do that for you. Yeah, how, tell them how important it is to know how to build that wall behind them. All they have to do is use the earth that surrounds them to do these things. They don't have to have 250 NGOs in over 50 countries in their, in their country with different agendas, you know, teaching them how to do these things. So she's a very powerful woman for these, for these kids to listen to. This is a project that uh, she helped start in Astalaf, which is a small mountain town. Uh, and basically, it's an all-women's co-op. And they have taught each other how to tailor, do very skilled stitching, and make all kinds of really cool uh, jewelry from stones that are native to Afghanistan. This is awesome, okay? This is basically an outfit built out of cut-up burqas. And what the women did when they started this co-op was they cut up their burqas and made all kinds of different things out of them. Uh, and then they resell them as dresses, bags, and, and all kinds of other things it kinda, as, a, as a point of liberation for them. And they, they not only need to burn something, but they wanted to turn it into something beautiful and then push it back out. So this was, it was just amazing to see. I was in tears. This is a orphanage that um, is called Mohova's Promise. And it was very interesting. I wasn't anticipating coming across something like this, but uh, over 50% of the kids here are orphaned from war. And they have a pretty progressive program here. They teach permaculture. Uh, they teach uh, all kinds of different gardening classes, tailoring. They have their own in-house dentist. They teach Taekwondo. Basically, they have this 
very long list of life skills that helps them uh, integrate into society after living in this orphanage. And they only take the worst of the worst situations, not children, but people who absolutely have no other option. And it was the most well-behaved group of kids I've ever been around in my life, to be perfectly honest. And it was just a really beautiful experience, uh, and I hope someday I get to go back and see these kids again. There is, and in this picture we have, back in the upper left-hand corner, thank you. <laughs> this is Muhammad John. He's one of the, he's kind of one of the leaders in the Afghan Youth Peace Volunteers. He's a little older. He's 23, 24. Uh, and a lot of the kids look to him for guidance, uh, and he provides it. He's a very, he's a very beautiful person. That smile that he has right now, he always has. I'm pretty sure he sleeps with that smile on his face. Which says a lot about them as Afghans. You know, they've been living with war for almost 30 years, and they still get up and smile every day. We could learn some stuff from them. Next to him is Feiss. Um, and uh, Feiss is a real strong-headed guy. Uh, and I think he's a little bit younger than Muhammad John. And all these kids are from Bamiyan. Uh, I don't know if you all know where Bamiyan is, but... You've probably seen the pictures of the Buddha statue that was blown up at some point in time. Well, that's, that's the town of Bamiyan, and that's where all these kids are from. This is a child at an IDP camp in Kabul, an internally displaced persons camp. Uh, and there's almost 10,000 people in this camp alone. There's estimated over 35,000 IDPs in Kabul alone. Uh, and basically, internally displaced people are people that are Afghans but can no longer live on their farms. Most of these people were farmers uh, who migrated to Kabul because it was the safest place for them to be. Uh, and we asked them, you know, how long do you plan on being here? And so we've, we've already been here for five years and we're probably going to spend the rest of our life here because we just can't imagine going back into the violence that we were living in before. So this is kind of on the flip side of the, the orphanage, you know. There, there's really good positive projects like that, but on the other end, there are still people living, uh, living like this, and it's kind of a, a bizarre thing to see because across the street was what is called the Great Wall of Kabul, which is a huge wall surrounding a military base. It goes for miles. Very expensive, beautiful. It's a lavish wall. Probably costs millions of dollars. And on the other side of the street, you have 10,000 people living under tarps. And it's, uh, it's quite a dichotomy. Um, in the winter, they don't use anything to warm their homes, they use blankets, and it gets re really cold in Afghanistan because of the high elevation. And um, the men have trouble finding work because they're Pashtun, and obviously Pashtun, because they wear turbans. And uh, they're all from either Helmand Province, Kandahar, or another Taliban-dominant area where, uh, where, the, where the Marines and the U.S. Army are doing a lot of work against against insurgents bombing them and so on. Okay, this is a civic education class that we just happened to stumble across in Paran province. And basically, this course focuses on teaching interpretations of Islam that line up with treating women equally. Uh, that's the main focus of the project. Uh, and civic responsibility, the power of voting, the power of owning your own life. Uh, and it was a three-day course. We stumbled into the end of it, and all of these gentlemen were very, very happy to have gone through the training that they had gone through. Almost every single one of them walked up to me holding a certificate in front of him, woman, wanting me to take a picture of him. And I gladly did it. It was very beautiful. And who is responsible for this is uh, Afghan Women's Skills Development Council. And basically, this is a group of women that form an organization, and I'm quoting the director when I'm saying this, who told us that if you want a better life for women in Afghanistan, you have to educate the men. <laughs> Not just the women and the children. As kind of a slap in the face to Greg Mortensen, you know, it's like you can't just talk about educating women and children. The men are the ones treating the women badly. So they're the ones who need the education in order to keep them from doing that. And these men were really happy to learn that. This right here uh, is a picture outside of Kabul Garden. Uh, and these were uh, three street or four street kids that were just adorable. Uh, they shared a little bit of their story with us, but basically none of them know their age. 
as most youth in Afghanistan, they don't know when they're born, so they don't know how old they are. And uh, they, they're fairly happy kids, uh, and they enjoyed hanging out with us and, and sharing a little bit of their story with us. But I just I like to show this picture because it's kind of hard to grasp looking at these kids and thinking they have no idea how old they are. This is Abdullah. And we saw a picture of him earlier when the slideshow began. But um, him and I had a lot of very, very touching exchanges. Because I'm a hillbilly, to be perfectly honest. I'm from Arkansas. And I play the banjo. And I couldn't get away f from it if I wanted to. But when we first got there, he asked all of us, where are you from? And everyone was like, oh, we're from Chicago, we're from New York, we're from D.C. And I was like, I'm from the Washita Mountains. And he was like, well, I'm from the Bamiyan Mountains. And I was like, oh, I'll see. So, so what did you do before you came here? And I helped a friend of mine harvest a bunch of potatoes. He runs an organic farm in the Ozarks. And uh, he was like, we just planted our potatoes. And I was like, oh, wow. Um, and I was like, well, you know, in the United States, they call me a hillbilly. And uh, he kind of he laughed and he's like, well, in Afghanistan, they call us mountain boys. <laughs> and that was really beautiful for me to understand and to sit and have this conversation with this Afghan hillbilly. And to understand, you know, that we're all the same. You know, we're just a bunch of farmers trying to plant our potatoes. Uh, and there's this really absurd thing happening where we're training our farmers to kill farmers while the world starves. So this is a picture of Brock making a funny face. And I put this on here because he made himself a pepper sandwich, literally, and then ate it. And I watched his face for two or three minutes and then decided to take a picture so I could tell a story about it. So. In my defense, I was vegetarian and all they had was meat and jalapenos and tomatoes. And I was told that the seeds are where all the spiciness is and I took them out, but that's false. The entire pepper is spicy. <laughs> and also, by the way, this is Badshah Khan. His nickname is Frontier Gandhi, and he was one of Gandhi's best friends. They actually lived together for a couple years when Khan had to go on the run, so.